Hello, everyone. Um, look, it really is a, a pleasure to be uh, back here speaking. I, I really like uh, this particular conference and I really like the activities of, of the Mechanical Contractors Association. I think the BIMEP Oz initiative is absolutely fantastic in being something that's driven from the, from the ground up. It's the industry getting out there with their own initiative, grasping the nettle, doing what the industry needs in order to, to progress. Um, in, improve their standards and their, their way of working, their, their general efficiency without waiting for government mandates or somebody else to come along and, and tell them to do it. I, I think that that's just absolutely fantastic, which is why as an architect I've been to uh, most of these, these conferences. I think it's fantastic you're at the, the, uh, the tenth year of, of this um, conference and it's, it's a real credit to all of the people who've been involved with it over the years. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about um, communication, collaboration and risk on a, on a project that um, we've been uh, working on recently. So a little bit of a, a background story here. Uh, at the end of 2017, we were approached by John Holland's, um, at that point, new development and investment division. Uh, they had bought a site at Macquarie Park in the northern part of Sydney and were going to do a, a multi-building campus uh, office park development on that site. Uh, this was the first building to be built. Um, we've called it Building C for most of the time that we've been working on it. Uh, and uh, they presented us with an opportunity uh, where they said that for this development, given it was new uh, to their division and it was going to set the standard for their future development, they wanted to use the full gamut of the BIM opportunity. Um, they had had incumbent architects on uh, this, this building, the designers, Fitzpatrick and Partners. Uh, they did not want to continue with the process um, that John Holland were um, going to um, deliver the pro project with. Um, so we were given the opportunity to, uh, to have a look at it and think about what it was going to be and it would we participate. So the highest level of BIM and the highest level of smart building technology uh, leading to facilities management, leading to the fully connected, um, uh, curated experience for uh, the people who were taking this, this building, which had already been let to a, a single government client. So uh, they were, of course, using clash detection and coordination. This is the low-hanging fruit of BIM that absolutely everybody gets. And uh, if, if there is ever a model, and increasingly there is, um, this is always going to be used on, on the project once the model is av available. It can be a bit patchy if there's not complete models available. But um, as the low-hanging hang fruit, uh, it's definitely happened happening all the time. Uh, unfortunately, from my perspective as somebody who's uh, tried to promote the use of BIM and all of the opportunities of BIM for many years now, uh, that's often where it stops, that basically we have <coughs> clash detected models and then they're not being used for any other parts of the, uh, of the BIM opportunity. So on this project, we're using um, cost estimating uh, from Mitchell Brantman. So I thought, well, fantastic. We've been trying to work with Mitchell Brantman for years. We know that they really do the real deal of measurement from the model and we want to participate in that process, have a good project together. Construction sequencing, uh, this was with solid support. Again, we've gone out to many clients over the years and said, hey guys, you really should be developing a good model and you should be using construction sequencing on, on your project. Finally, we had an opportunity. Integrated building automation uh, with MELD. MELD are uh, uh, brilliant at understanding the, the merging of the technologies that's required to make um, a fully automated building work um, and use that for you know, the, the benefit you can get from the data analytics you can gain from that, having a dashboard to control it, just improve user experience and energy efficiency and, and all of the rest of it. Uh, so BIM to support FM. So with all of this, we thought, well, fantastic. We, we want to be um, involved with this. 
Um, and then they told us that the consultants were all going to be selected on the basis of their professional backgrounds in their specific fields. They weren't being selected specifically on the basis of their BIM capabilities. And we thought, well, that's, that's a little bit strange, isn't it? Because we think that a high BIM capability would be pretty much a prerequisite to work in this kind of environment. So here's, here's the team here, and um, you know, it's, a, it's a great team, they've all been good to, to work with. They then told us that what was going to happen was that all of the model creation was going to be put into the hands of Atlas in Vietnam, uh, outsourcing um, team. They would be producing the models in all disciplines, it was all going to happen in uh, Autodesk's um, Revit work sharing BIM 360 environment. Um, we would all have access to the models because that's, that's in the cloud. So uh, we, we can all be geographically separated and, and still have full access to the mo model. But predominantly, they would be responsible for doing the, the work. So this put us into you know, quite a, a period of, of considering this offer and whether we would participate and how we would participate, what the risks were going to be and how it might work for us. Because generally we'll have a team that's got some kind of pyramid structure to it. Um, we'll have people who are experienced that um, will be involved with the, the management and the, the control of the project and um, the design issues, uh, keeping on top of all of those things. And then we'll have other people who will be in the model, uh, developing the model, creating our documentation um, and doing the project administration tasks. And it's a very fuzzy line between those two and we all tend to be a little bit involved in all of those, those uh, factors. But then we thought, well, what happens if you change it so that it becomes like this? That now we've got a hard line, which is potentially the distance between us and Vietnam, between us in the project control, design, and, and um, management side of it, and then the modeling, documentation, and administration so, so we thought, well, how are we going to keep on top of what they're doing? We, we have never, at Architectus, used outsourcing before. It's not been appealing to us. Um, appreciate the value of lowering a cost base in the delivery of, of our um, scope requirements on a project, but uh, we've just never been sure what the quality of the work that we were going to get from an outsourced team was going to be, and also the amount of effort that we were going to have to put into keeping control of them. So on this, on this project, we started to think very hard about that. And in a way, uh, I think we came to the realisation that BIM was probably part of our solution, that we could, we could find out a lot about the health of our design and documentation by finding the right kind of queries, if you like, of the model and um, making sure that we were continually checking the health of the design and the documentation through, through the model. Um, we also thought that in dealing with a geographically separate team, that would tell us a few things about our own workflows and how we could more effectively and efficiently administer some of our own projects and how um, what level of information needs to be given to the staff who are performing things at the task level on a, on a project, how clear that has, has to be, um, what feedback loops you might need to, to set up, whether you need to develop every workflow and convey that and then you know measure its ongoing performance and whether we should be doing this with our own teams because probably without that geographic split we've probably been saying to people go go ahead and do this and that and then not really having 
done the task ourselves first or um, or gone back to check to see how it is how it is being performed in the same way that we're really forced to do when it's a, a geographically separate team so our our team structure becomes this one with really a atlas very much at the the center of things so i'll just take a little break now to tell you uh, who we are and who i am um, i'm rob Perea. i'm a Principal of uh, Architectus. I'm based in Sydney. I'm also the uh, the Group Design Technology Manager. Um, I've been um, personally uh, hands-on using Revit every day for the last 17 years, so it's it's really beginning to uh, to rack up. Um, I keep myself uh, on the tools uh, because I really want to be aware of all of the issues that are facing our staff in uh, meeting the requirements of the, the deliverables on projects and I, I think we've We've got to have people at senior management level who really understand the detail of what we need to deliver and how we, we need to deliver it. So Architectus is uh, in all uh, Australian mainland uh, state capitals. We're about 450 people across Australia and we're probably about another 80 or so in two offices in New Zealand. And we've done quite a geographic um, spread of work. The, um, the, the ski lodge in uh, Niseko was a project that everybody wanted to work on. Um, the, uh, we won that, won that one at, uh, in, a, in a competition, so that, that was great. I can't afford to stay there. I, I looked at its prices and uh, I thought there was, a, there was an extra zero on there for the price that I thought it was going to be. Anyway, um, now our tagline is explore, collaborate, create. And I, I think it is something that we really, uh, we really live. And collaboration has been very much at the heart of our processes. We, we don't have an in-house design style. The firm's not named after one individual. Um, we've assembled teams for projects on the basis of the requirements of the, the, those projects. We've got our own geographic spread. We, we've now actually moved to the cloud for all of our Revit use across all of our offices. So there's, with some of the learnings really from, from what we've had with working for, with Vietnam, that now we um, are able to use uh, our human resources that might exist in any one of our offices on, on any of our projects a, a, as necessary. Um, and we've been... Uh, yeah, we've been... Um, so, so this is some of our international collaborations. So uh, I, was, um, I, was, I was pleased to see uh, SOM uh, up before in Andrew's presentation because... Uh, uh, this one here is uh, 100 Mount Street, uh, North Sydney, which uh, we've designed in collaboration with SOM. Um, so they're still into the, the bracing, obviously. Um, that one's just open. That's also a very um, complete BIM project. Uh, then we're working with, uh, with Fosters, with Ingenhoven, with uh, Make, oops, uh, with uh, Wilkinson Air, with John Neville. Um, and with Woha, so we're, and th these are just some of our collaborations. We've also won quite a few things in our own right. So, um, but these are all great experiences. They really, really broaden us a as people and as a firm. I think. So right, we've been early adopters of BIM, um, and uh, you know, authoring was the first one we got. We were it was lonely BIM for a long time. Uh, a lot of People are sort of caught up, uh, especially widening out the disciplines that are uh, using uh, BIM in the way that they work. Um, but that means that we've moved on. So now that we're looking at how we can use BIM to um, improve the way we deliver a whole lot of things beyond the creation of the BIM and its use on a construction site or for an FM purpose, but just internally on, on some things that I'll talk about in, in, in a minute. So um, really, uh, it does uh, facilitate the collaborative process. I think we'll see some examples of that. To me, BIM's are sort of the campfire. Everybody's gathered around exchanging information on, on a project, and it's it's remarkable how um, projects have actually changed. But what we'd like to do is gain some of the benefits that we can get with a, a true integrated project delivery process 
in an Australian environment that really doesn't have integrated project delivery. But you, we can perhaps synthesise some of those things. So a few things about the building. It's an A-grade commercial office building. Uh, it, it, it's quite big. It's got quite high um, standards for it, its um, environmental performance and its building um, quality for users and the like. It's really, you know, positioning itself um, to be um, at the top of the market over a 30-year-plus um, period. Uh, this is the state of it uh, two days ago, so um, we think we'll probably be open in uh, early next year, um, March or February. Um, so it's, you know, it's really coming along. So the, the project is uh, on Aconex. I'm sure everybody's uh, very used to working in Aconex in environments. Um, this is the, um, the Aconex model stack, which is uh, an IFC um, export from the Revit models. Um, so I, this is an aside, I can say, when, when you're in a full BIM process, in fact, the models are being delivered and pu published on a regular basis in multiple, multiple formats so that there's uh, a large number of points of entry for different people on the project according to their own capabilities and what software they, they use. This Aconex model stack makes that absolutely open to everybody, including um, John Holland themselves as the, the client in this case, that you don't need any software capability to open this up on, on the web and look at it. Um, so to explain the building, it's a very wide, large floor plate building. And uh, to uh, alleviate the daylighting issues, it's got a, a central atrium uh, through the whole building. So that gives it some really quite complex um, fire engineering requirements. And so that's something that's been worked through um, in, in great uh, detail. Um, it ideally suits the um, the client that's moving in there's transport for New South Wales. It's uh, going to allow them a big, large floor plate that, that's uh, ideal for collaborative um, work in their own teams that can be uh, reconstituted on a project um, basis. So Ridley produced a digital project brief for the, the project. Um, and so this is the standard that everyone gets held to. Ultimately, in the consultant phase before the contracting side of John Holland were involved, uh, this means that Atlas, basically, across all disciplines, are held to this uh, standard. Um, I'm not sure whether people have um, all, across all of the consultant organisations, are really understood the fine detail of everything that's said in here, but it's certainly been very handy to me to wave around occasionally in design meetings to remind people that this is a BIM project and there's no getting around the requirement that everything be in the model and the model be used for all of the, um, the purposes that the, the client had wanted. So this is a sort of structural diagram of how Atlas were going to be involved in the project. You can see they're sort of at the, at the, the top of the stack of each, uh, each discipline. Probably hasn't worked out quite like that because um, we haven't been able to let go from being in the model daily basis, constantly uh, working with them. Uh, I think some of the other consultants might have had a more um, stand apart kind of way of, of doing things. So first, uh, to, 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 to collaborate. The consultant teams, basically, we're going to be involved in the design and, and management. Uh, the BIM 360 process, um, it's in the cloud, it's accessible from everywhere, and all models for all disciplines are loaded and can be viewed within our model at all times. So we don't create in a separated architectural model uh, and then later federate in Navisworks, although that does happen for site, but uh, we have all other disciplines in our architectural model uh, at all, all time um, 
to help inform our design. So I think that Autodesk has really created an ecosystem here that is the equivalent of the 3B um, you know, web server that was anticipated by this diagram about 10 years ago, um, that models more or less real time. Um, with the structural in engineers, we don't use um, Autodesk's um, publish technique, which sort of crystallizes the model and, and issues it on a sort of se semi-regular basis. We actually use the one where the models are live linked. So whenever we get a change to the structural model, it is immediately there after a save and reload uh, in our model. So that keeps us uh, very up to date with it. I think this, this kind of dynamic web server, um, it's great for knowing exactly what's um, in the scope of all of the other disciplines. So Atlas, um, there's some real benefits I've realised now with having people who are just dedicated to modelling. So, I mean, we, we uh, are fully revved our, ourselves. We, um, might use a few things like Rhino along, along the, the way, but uh, all of our projects are delivered using Revit as our only platform, and we have some pretty high capability there. But that doesn't mean that every one of the people at Architectus is using some of the more arcane tools in Revit on a daily basis, so we can get a bit rusty in, in, in whatever that we haven't touched for a, for a while. These guys at Atlas have got their own training institute. They've got um, enough people so that if you, you need somebody who's a whiz at topo surface or stairs or whatever, they've got that in-house. They've got uh, people who can code on the fly to create the tools that they might need if we ask them to do some repetitive task. They've got some people to, uh, to automate that. We could probably do that too, but the timeline would be that we'd ask for the automation and we'd get it, you know, three weeks after we absolutely needed it. So um, they've got uh, massive flexibility in resourcing. So as projects change direction and, and ramp up their requirements for staffing levels, they can just throw more people in, you know, in the tens of people where we just can't, across our organisation, find people that, that quickly and that e easily. And... We held them to a very high bar. You know, there's, there's no excuses allowed on the quality of the models, on the precision of the, the models, on the timeliness. They have to deliver us um, stuff days in advance so that we can give it thorough checking before it goes out without name on it. John, John Holland have uh, engaged Atlas directly themselves. We're not, we're not paying them. So... Um, Really, the, um, the, the, the risks are understood and the, the risks that way of, of this um, contract environment are being, are being um, dealt with. But um, there's certainly been some um, yeah, benefits uh, in it. And look, all the mundane tasks, it, there's, there's so much uh, with exporting and publication and creation of PDF sets and DWG sets and all sorts of stuff that's still demanded by an industry that operates at 10 different speeds at once, that uh, they are able to take on all of those sort of tedious tasks. It means that we can concentrate on managing the project and, and doing the design work. So that connects stacks, very uh, powerful for viewing. Um, we, um, we set up some... Uh, parameters with them. Um, uh, we, we gave them our, our documentation guidelines, which uh, sort, of, uh, sort of chapter and verse capture of our own workflows that, that we have uh, codified over the years. Um, we tend to create some of the more complex parametric families that might be um, delivering a particular piece of information or something to a design. We tend to, to generate those ourselves. We'll often do things like um, set up a, a view, uh, create a template of it, and then ask them to roll that out across the project or to all places. Um, I don't tend to like the idea of uh, working views. I prefer views that are set up for a specific management purpose. So rather than everybody's their name on it, working view, we'll have a room management 
set of plan views, we'll have uh, a wall management set of plan views, a door management set of plan views, or, or all of these kind of things where you'd like to be able to see at a glance whether a system is working or, or not working or where it needs more attention. This, um, this is just from a Revit screen, and this um, shows just how threaded together these models are. Um, so this is just from my live working Revit session. Uh, I've highlighted the structural model in blue there, and it's in the context of the other models, and they are all just totally and tightly uh, integrated together uh, across the board um, with no duplication. So um, it's been an issue in this industry that um, not being able to rely on the structural model for my annotations for the architectural scope requirement of horizontal dimensioning of concrete, um, the placement of hobs, uh, set downs, and all of those kind of issues. Uh, it's never been the situation that we've been able to rely on a structural model. It wouldn't be there in a timely way, most likely. Uh, it doesn't have features like set downs and hobs. Uh, it, um, if an object was deleted and replaced with an exact replica, I would lose all of my dimensioning and tagging and all, everything that was associated with that. On this project, because Atlas have the responsibility of both the architectural model and the structural model, then we've been able to use the structural model without any duplication and just use that directly to create our concrete outline plans. And that same argument goes for light fittings on our RCPs or um, fixtures in our bathrooms and the like. They all come from their own correct uh, discipline model and nothing ends up having to be done twice. There's a fair bit of um, work around getting that to work because our, our symbolic representation of something might be um, different to somebody else's, but then when it is in all of the hands of one party, you can have that conversation. I'm, if, if I try to do it with a, say with a um, hydraulic consultant to tell them that their um, representation of, a, 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 I don't know, a, a basin needs to be a very clean symbol for my architectural plans because we're fussy about what our drawings look like still, I'm not likely to get a very good response from them. But when, when it's one party responsible for doing all of this work, I can actually say, you put, your, put the architectural symbol in at one detail level inside the object, use the other two detail levels for two different flavours of um, hydraulic outputs and then we can all get what we want with the same object um, which is still able to be used for every um, BIM purpose. Um, so we tend to communicate directly through the model with, with Atlas and we've got a zillion lines of communication, we're on Skype all the time and, and uh, but one of them is when we're trying to work something out, one of the things that was vexing us when we first thought about this project was what happens to all of the discovery of the things that need to influence the design if we're not uh, in the model and, and teasing out the model and trying things out in the model? Now, we are in the model and we are doing things in the, in the model, but to a degree we've been able to alleviate that a little bit with... Um, doing some sketch work in a set of views that are set up to communicate with Atlas uh, that are in the model, doing some, doing some sketch work of what we want. Um, here we're laying out grommets on the floor and, and getting them moved from the positions that they first land in into locations that avoid the PT that's running through the slab. So another nice BIM thing, all the PT is modelled in this. Um, so we know exactly where, where those strands are. Um, so we can give very, very precise instructions, millimetre precise instructions in the model to, to Atlas. And then when they've performed the work, we, we can just see that they've locked on to where our sketch work was and that it's exactly what they asked them to do. So it's a, it's a means of checking. 
because I prefer to have that than to play this game of spot the difference, right? I, I, if I'm doing this, if I'm trying to compare my sketch on a PDF with a, a, a Revit view or something like that, it's a difficult game of spot the difference. If I want to see whether my sketch lines now line up with where the object has been placed, it's a very easy game of, of, of spot the difference where it's immediately obvious um, if something hasn't been changed away. And, you know, they, they are good in saying if we sketch something up that's not, not quite working, they'll come back and, and they'll ask um, questions of it. Um, so we tend to manage the systems, uh, fire compartmentation, doors, acoustics, thermal performance, those, those, those kind, kind of things, uh, the view template side. One I mentioned, one, one way that we communicate with them is um, we create tasks in a little app that's been created by our BIM Consulting subsidiary um, called, called BCAP, and it's basically just a task generator and tracker, and the, the task can be made um, from a screen grab or from anything, and it's then assigned an ID, allocated to a person, um, a, given a, a timeline and, and can be can be tracked. So um, the the benefits of this is we, we don't want to be adding more to the pile of communication that's coming through Aconex. This is stuff that's direct us to Atlas. So we just want that um, sort of direct hotline of of communication from us to them that still allows us to um, keep track and, and, and manage the issues. And then we can get reports on where things are up to and uh, you know, whether they've been resolved or, or progress. We can run some analytics on what tasks have or haven't been done and, and know where our um, model status is, is up to. Um, with, with Atlas, we've, we've taken this further than we had previously with our own teams. We're now starting to use this with our own teams, that we'll, we'll do this across every project now uh, with our own teams, so that we're, rather than have an Excel spreadsheet sheet of our you know, scope and to-do list and who's doing it and all this, we'll, we'll do it this way and we can monitor the health of our own projects. Now, as I... As I um, mentioned, uh, as soon as you've got BIM on a project, it changes the way you do the project. If this is a, a, a design meeting that's on, on site. That is a federated Navisworks model in, in this case. Um, once you've got the model there, any design issue that needs to be talked through, and th these are probably coordination issues, um, um, that will just be dealt with um, straight away by going and looking at that part of the building in the model. You wouldn't start to shuffle through sets of drawings to find out what was going in. And, and uh, for the AG Coombs um, people, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with AG Coombs on this project as, as, as well. And uh, it's, it's good to see that um, somebody with the, the capability has uh, come on to the, the project to to give us fully modelled mechanical services on the project. I think um, Coombs did not use Atlas. Most of, this, most of the subcontractors haven't had internal capability uh, and they have used Atlas to do their subcontractor models as well, but uh, Coombs didn't need to do it. There's, uh, there's Pavel um, from your Sydney office there um, pointing out where he's going to probably ask us to introduce something into the, the top level plant room. Um, but yeah, it really changes the way that you work. Um, once you, you can do it this way, you do do it this way. And because we're in the cloud, we can actually make quick changes directly from the site office. So we've actually got Revit open here and can make a quick modification rather than add it to our to-do list. So coordination. Um, we really got multiple lines of defence. Um, we've got our own internal processes. We've got the things that uh, Atlas do. So their project team, they've got uh, a number of expats who are used to Australian standards and way, ways of working. Um, BIM EPOS content is used across this project. The, it's Their lead mechanical designers are very um, familiar with the, the content. They have Australian training and, and origins. 
Um, they, uh, Atlas will raise issues with us. There's regular reports, there's reports from, from Ridley, there's our own, own processes. We've really been getting into a, a whole mode of um, clash avoidance, really, rather than, uh, you know, model it wrong once and then come back and, and, and fix it. When you, when you have all models present at all times in your authoring environment, then that changes the way that you do the design. You're not going to do it as a first cut, wait for it to get federated, come back, realise there's a problem, and it, to, you know, decide who's going to move or, or whatever. It's all, it's all there live. You can get on the phone to sort it out. I started to create for ourselves um, coordination views. So these are not um, published architectural plans, but they are architectural plans to show me where everything has been placed from mechanical, hydraulic, electrical disciplines, um, et cetera, so that I can really understand what's going on there. Um, in our tight spaces, at critical parts of the design, that's just all very you know, complex and uh, we might as well take advantage of it. Here we can see how threaded now the mechanical uh, and all of the services designs are in the project, I've just I've just greyed out the architecture and the and the the, the structure here, but um, it's all very complex and, and detailed. One one good thing about working with uh, an, an atlas is also that they have the the time and the role to really make sure that this model is 100% rigorous and 100% complete. So if if this was our architectural team, and um, if something was not necessarily a BIM project where it was going to be used for BIM downstream uses, I, I doubt I'd really be getting, you know, notching of my walls around beams and things like that. But this is the standard that's been, been set. And at their lower cost base, they can afford to do that. So I sort of wonder about the industry in a way that uh, if we are going to be asked to produce models of this precision and this rigour because they are going to be used for those downstream uses, then can we actually do that within the fee basis that we've, we've got? I think we have to be, you know, norm, normal level of precision is one price and this level of precision is, a, is another one. Uh, or these things will have to get go overseas to be done. So, I also produce um, architectural published plans that show things like uh, plant rooms with all the plant and equipment in there because I want not just us to be able to understand it but everybody else to be able to understand uh, what that layout, layout is and um, if, if they're not doing it then I'll do it because I think it's very, very valuable um, to the to the project to know where all of this kind of stuff is. So, um, yeah, uh, clash of avoidance I did mention. So, so there, um, Atlas have got like a, a zillion processes that are just finding finding issues. I think we have many, many different ways of trapping potential problems on the project, which is given us a clash-free pr project and I, I think we've probably built one of everything at this point. So I think um, I can be reasonably confident that it's going to to um, stay that way. Um, they've developed some scripting to, to help that out. Um, so there's a lot of thought and a lot of um, uh, good process brought into it. And then Mitchell Brantman, another line of defence, Mitchell Brantman also do this in, in their work. They're, they're consuming the models for the cost estimating purpose, uh, but they also do validations because they need to be very, very precise. They're, they're doing things, you know, site measures, monthly payments and stuff, the verification of what's actually been installed and, and not installed. There's, there's uh, laser scanning out, out there on site. The whole thing is being recorded all the time. There's a strong wireless network operating everywhere on, during construction, etc. Et so it's really taking advantage of all of the benefits that we can get um, from a from a BIM um, process. So that's verify. That's the uh, that's the laser scanning that's that's going on. So risk risk is something that um, you know 
concerns me a lot as a, an architect, um, and especially it did on a, a, a project where we're having work done for us by other people. Just how are we going to manage those risks? And I think my, my number one thing is to make BIM truly that single point of truth. I, I mean, I know it's a cliche and blah, 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 but we've got here a model that is complete, is precise, is accurate, and I can use it to find out what the current status of everybody's design is. And I would really much prefer to be going to the model to find out what the design of a plant room is, or then to go through and try and track all the PDF issues or whatever that have come through over the last six months and hope I got the last cut of it or, or whatever to know what's going on on the, the project. So we're very risk aware. We, we look at things like this. This is, um, again, it's a, one of our drawings. Um, initially, we started doing drawings like this to um, look at um, the completeness of our correct selection of, you know, wall systems for fire performance or for acoustic performance or whatever, and they were sort of internal. But what we're finding now is in, a, in an industry that's under a lot of pressure at the moment, and certainly the, uh, the code certification aspect of it is under enormous pressure, uh, I'm, first I'm getting pressured to... Um, do a design that's 100% compliant, of course, uh, and then sign off on that it is 100% compliant. So if I'm going to do that, I need to know that it is 100% compliant and I need some way of representing that to me. So this kind of drawing does that because I can see any breaks in the chain of compartmentation. Uh, I can also understand the size of my compartments and all, all of those other issues that, that might be factors. But then I can also issue this drawing to the certifier so that they just don't have me saying so. They actually have a drawing given to them that proves the points that I'm making that we are 100%. So I think that that's very powerful. And in, in terms of um, being able to capture the information that comes in from multiple sources over the life of a project, in this case, it is what the code requirements of um, fire walls would be, um, they're, they're not actually the deemed to satisfy code requirements because um, that almost doesn't happen in the sophisticated buildings we build now. I can go and look up the code. I could probably do the first cut of this fire compartmentation myself without a problem. But once you get a fire engineer on board, then they're going to say, well, if you do this, you can lower this rating here. Or if you're going to have an atrium, you need to raise this rating here. And it's going to be something that is different to what the code tells you. So we get their markups usually, something pretty low tech. But we then put that into our fire compartmentation plans as the, as the dashed lines there, indicating what the wall performance that's required in a location is, and then by filtering the view and extracting the, the fire resistance level parameter from the wall itself, we can then colour code the walls if they meet the performance requirements. So that allows me to find the, the breaks in the chain and also to know what it was that we were instructed to do previously. And that these are all documents that basically require to be maintained through the life. But then I, I prefer to have that than this game here of whack-a-mole where you have issues that come up out of nowhere, the phone call from site, the dread phone call from site that something, you know, somebody's rejected something or it's not, not or some major problem that I would have to go and investigate and find out why it happened and what was our instruction originally and it's going back through a zillion documents, and all, all of that kind of stuff. So to me, that's, um, that's very powerful. It is powerful in this environment where we're just, flooded with information. So 270 people is a number on the Aconex distribution list. I, I get an email sent to me from Aconex when something new with my name on it comes in. And what's happening is that I have to scroll that 
email through three windows on, on Outlook to get to the subject header after all of the distribution list to find out what the, what the thing's about. Um, any particular issue, this is, this is, this is one on, on the keyword of, of uh, fire compartment. So there's just a zillion documents for all of this kind of stuff. If you have to track and trace an issue, it's an enormous amount of work. And I really want to lower the cost and overhead of acquiring the information that I need to get the you know, optimally performing um, project and, and uh, set of documents. So, so 4,500 was the number of Aconex messages I'm copied into up to March. So it's gotten much worse than that, but I didn't go back and measure it again. So that was to March, that was to March this year. So it's all needle in a haystack stuff. You can, you can deal with it as it comes up or, um, I don't know, cr cross your fingers and hope, I think, because you may not be able to readily find this stuff again. Actually, it's, it's interesting how the mind works because if you do have to trace something like this, you're trying to think of a keyword that might have been in that document and, and, you, and you often can think of a keyword that might have been in that document to, to do your search. But anyway, it's, it's, it's near to impossible. Um, and this is the number of files in our project folder. So we have to, you know, file all of our correspondence somewhere and different versions of models and things that were issued and, and, and stuff. Again, crazy, crazy numbers. How, how, do you, how do you find this stuff? That's another game I don't really want to play. Um, I do, um, like, uh, Where's Wally? Or, or for people who don't use the metric system, that's Where's Waldo, isn't it? So, so um, uh, you know, just finding s this stuff, if you have to go um, uh, back to find it, it's just, it, you know, a near impossible task. So looking at a few things inside the model, just to, on, again on managing those risks, um, we do clearance envelopes that can be clashed because um, obviously major risk factor that we need to get right. Uh, we especially do that around things like accessible parking, um, which is, um, you know, you don't get a second chance after the concrete's in place, so that, that's stuff that, that's just got to, be, got to be right. Accessibility, again, it's a whole other big vexed issue. Um, accessibility is something we have set up as a set of particular plans to manage it, and you could, you could clash this stuff, you could create it as 3D and clash it, but actually I find it more useful quicker and easier to do this as sets of plans that can be visually inspected uh, because the clash is a process that you have to run and takes time and less likely that you're doing it. And what you need to be doing is actually reviewing all of this stuff on a very regular basis because we can do it and have it right and then part of our accessibility envelope might get uh, colonised by somebody for a stack or something like like that, and now it's now it's non-compliant, and they they just see some space that's available, and, and something goes in there, and and then um, then we've got a compliance problem. So these things are actually quite complicated. The code's quite complicated. The 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 maths of the changing numbers is quite complicated, and the um, the the numbers can actually be interpolated between between these preset points. The code actually says you interpolate the numbers between those preset points. So um, there's, there's quite complex math. So what we've, we've developed the Revit family there that actually measures the, um, the distance across the doorway and applies the right code envelope according to the conditions. And we, we have, you, you select what approach conditions you, you want. We've had to take doors to the nth degree with this too because even things like our door frames affect our building in, they affect all of the detailing. The whole thing is live in the model, so our doors actually represent the frame that is going in there, the, actually the correct frame profile. Our door schedule comes um, straight uh, from that. Our detailing is actually a snapshot call out from that part of the model with the minimum amount of, of detail work on it. And there is in fact very little detail work on the whole project. Which does bring us to something else that we're um, developing at the moment which uh, we're calling uh, 
mission control. I think other people are probably calling theirs mission control also. Um, but what we're doing is we're, um, we're getting some uh, data reporting on our Revit models or on Atlas's Revit models or um, what we do is we, we have we have plugins that are attached to uh, Revit sessions. They write out events that happen in, in Revit and sort of at the end of the day, they also write out um, aspects of the model that we're looking for. That goes into a massive big uh, database and then from the database, um, we can um, construct all sorts of queries about things that we, um, want to look for. And we've, we've started to do this, it's sort of mostly what, you know, I, I just term like Revit issues in, in quotes, it's like um, the number of warnings and all those kind of things I, I know are important to, um, to model health. But uh, where I'd like to go with it is to find all of the things that are analogues of real architectural issues, code compliance issues, those, those kind of things. And it might be that somebody has hidden the model with detail work or something like that. So we have to think about um, what might be likely indicators that that's going on in the model. So we haven't really found a lot of it in this model, but uh, we've had it before that, uh, you know, a concrete edge is covered over with a detailed component which hides where the real edge is, and then it's either wrong in the model or wrong in the detail. So if we can look for those things, I was trying to do some kind of construct between the the detailing and what the scale of the drawing and wh whether it might be legitimate to be doing it that way in that kind of view or whatever so that we can go and look at the potential um, problem zones. So um, we look for, you know, if, if we've got GA plans that have huge field regions all over them, then why isn't that kind of stuff being, being modelled, you know? And uh, those are the things that we're beginning to look for. We're going to take this a lot, lot further, but uh, at the moment we're building our databases. And what we'd like to do is a sort of office-wide comparisons from project to project, and we'd, we'd like to look at people's time in Revit, and we'd like to understand what, you know, which, which projects are more or less healthy than other ones, which ones have more or less risk factors, what our best case um, projects are. Um, and I actually think 45 Waterloo Road, because of, because of that responsibility that, that Atlas took on, is actually one of our better performing um, projects. And, and it's been very easy, easy, um, handy for shining a light on our own processes and how we can improve some of the things that we do. Um, so I apologise for these, these um, slides, because I, I just wanted to say a few things and, uh, you know, I didn't have a great image to go with it, so I don't really like words on PowerPoint that much. But um, first of all, uh, you know, the end goal is really to build the BIM as it is in real life. It seems so obvious and yet people still don't get it and you still have to keep on ramming that home that the BIM is there to represent the real building. If something's got a rating, I want the rating in my BIM object, not just, you know, on a report somewhere. If um, if something has physical size, then I need to see it in my model. It can't be that we stick detailed stuff, you know, onto ceiling plans or something like that, because this stuff has physical size and location. We can still get our same quality of graphics and that. We can stick our detailed stuff inside our model elements and still get them to look the same. So, you know, it's a, a matter of um, getting people to move to the right process. And I... I mean, one guy on this project actually said that the information that they provided us was correct in their CAD file. The CAD file, not part of the documents that we're even looking at. It was kind of like an internal, internal thing for them that we... So it's got to be, you know, one representation, not, not multiple. It's in the standard detail. I hate standard details. In fact, I only, I only want people to take slices from the model and put detailing over it. I don't want them to get a standard detail out of a library and having this standard detail floating in space with no real connection to the, back to the building. Um, it's in the PDF schedule, so that was 
a, a classic. It's in the blue beam markup. So I, I guess blue beam is the height of technology for some people. So um, you, that, that kind of stuff drives me. A, a little story, I, I, I was um, looking at my fire compartmentation plans and at the level nine plant room, and I could not see how the compartment to the top story of the commercial building was created because there were fans there directly through a penetration in the in the floor that had no fire rated construction around, around it. And I was I was told by the engineers that the and this was this wasn't Coombs, this was the consultant, I was told that the fan came with a fire rating treatment. Um, that wasn't represented anywhere. So uh, I was, I'm looking for risk, risk factors and I can't see that that one has been covered for. So, um, yeah, this stuff just can't be in, you know, floating 45,000 files that we've got somewhere. Um, uh, it's got to be in the model where I can refer to it, I can respond to it, uh, and I can do what, do what I need to. So... You know, I think that we really got rigorous models. We got uh, fantastic um, quality defined documentation standards um, to a um, optimal process, and uh, we we have sort of engineered out all of the clash risks and those coordination risks that are prevalent on, on projects on this one with our multiple lines of defence and um, having established that um, single point of truth on the project. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>